Welcome to Halting Towards Zion, the podcast where we limp like Jacob to the promised land and talk about life, the universe, and everything along the way. Uh, we have come to the end of the book of Judges and are picking up with Ruth, which was originally, if I understand correctly, a sort of appendix to the book of Judges. Is that right? That's the position that the Jews took and that the church has often adopted as well. Mm-hmm. Um, and so we were coming to this story and there are a couple of different directions we would like to go with it. It's a very rich book. And the direction we were originally going to go with it, we decided was not as Christmassy as the other direction that we wanted to go. <laughs> so we are changing directions on a dime and talking about Ruth and Boaz and their love story and the kinsman redeemer and biblical imagery and stuff like that. So I wasn't expecting to have to say this because we were going to talk about something else. But Greg, would you tell us the story of Ruth and Boaz? <laughs> All right. Uh, it begins in uh, Bethlehem, Judah. Remember, we we just finished the story of Judges and the two stories that both involve Bethlehem, Judah. And Bethlehem doesn't come off very well in either of them. And here, the beginning is not auspicious. Bethlehem means house of bread. And yet, there's a famine in the land, either a direct judgment from God, drought or some such thing, or as a result of war, which happened a lot. And there is this man who we meet briefly. His name is Elimelech, which means God is king. He and his wife Naomi, which means sweetness, decide they're going to take their two boys, Mahan and Chilion, or Kilion, and go into the land of Moab. And there's a little bit of irony here. Bethlehem is the house of bread, but they have no bread. Mm-hmm. Last time we ran into Moab, the children of Israel were trying to get bread from them, and they absolutely <laughs> refused. No, you and there is a, no king in Israel. And there's no king in Israel. God and God is, is my, the king is leaving. Yeah. yeah. And God is king is leaving. So if that weren't bad enough, when they get there, Elimelech dies. Hmm. God is king. My God is king. He's dead. And after that, the two young men take wives from Moab, which... It's not necessarily ideal, but not necessarily forbid. It all depends upon, did they lead them to faith in Yahweh first? And as we read through, the answer seems to be yes and no. But anyway, they live there for a while. And both these young men, for reasons that are not explained in ways that we have no description, die in Moab. This leaves Naomi and her two daughter-in-laws, who love her. She's a sweet person, after all. But this whole thing kind of sours her. Her her husband is dead. Boys are dead. And now she hears that God has visited his people in mercy. And there's bread again in Israel, in Bethlehem. So she decides she might as well go back. She's got nothing here. She She has the two girls, but... They're still young. They're probably in their 20s or so. Uh, Still capable of marrying again and having children. But she's got nothing for them. She's an older woman now. And and so she tells them this. Go return each to her mother's house. The Lord deal kindly with you, as you've dealt with the dead and with me. The Lord grant you that you may find rest, each of you, in the house of her husband. She kissed them. They lifted up their voice and wept. Rest, that's something we'll return to later. Not rest in the sense of non-activity, but the rest of having someone take care of you and support you and provide for you and love you and create an atmosphere of tranquility and joy in which you will you will live with him. And later on, Naomi will say to Ruth, should I not seek rest for you? It's not the same word as Sabbath, but there, there's an overlap of ideas. And so she says, um, go back home. I, I got nothing for you, and um, love you all. But um, I hope you find I, f- I hope you find husbands, and, and and everything will be okay. They said, "Surely we will return with thee unto thy people." They make the offer to go back home with her. Naomi said, "Turn again, my daughters. Why will you go with me? Are there yet any more sons in my womb that they may be your husbands? Turn again, my daughters. Go your way, for I'm too old to have a husband. If I should say I have hope." And if I should have a husband also tonight and should also bear sons, 
Would you tarry for them till they were grown? Would you stay for them from having husbands? Nay, my daughters, it grieveth me much for your sakes that the hand of the Lord has gone out against me. So Naomi's take is the most important thing for you is to get married. And she's thinking here in terms of uh, the concept of Leverite marriage and, and kinsman redeemer. According to God's law, when brethren dwell together, if one if a, a brother married a woman and, and died without issue, then the next brother would marry the woman and raise up seed to his name. Uh, Naomi says, I don't have any more sons who can do that for you. They're both dead. My it's interesting dead. that she expects Ruth and Orpah to understand this concept, this custom. Yeah. They probably had talked about it. Ruth seems to know a lot of things. It's one thing to talk about the faith, to talk theology, something else to live it out. And here, when push comes to shove, she basically is telling them the most important thing in life is getting married. So go back to your families and, well, let me read a little bit more. This is what she actually says. They lifted up their voice and wept again, and Orpah, Kit, that's the other lady, kissed her mother-in-law, but Ruth clave unto her. And Naomi said, Behold, thy sister-in-law has gone back unto her people, and unto her gods return thou after thy sister-in-law. Orpah's gone back to her family and to her pagan religion that will condemn her to hell forever. Why don't you do the same? Mm -hmm. Naomi's got some Maybe. spiritual issues here. <laughs> Maybe getting married isn't the most important maybe thing to Ruth. Maybe not. <laughs> maybe it's not in general. And maybe in this case, it really isn't to Ruth. Because we're going to see what Ruth does. But this is how bitter and how twisted, how bitty, bitter Naomi has become and how twisted her, mm -hmm. her theological insight has become. No, the most important thing, you know, covenant and all that. We must perpetuate the covenant, dominion mandate, get married, have children. That's the most <laughs> important thing. And you can't do that back home because... And, and there's got to be running in the back of her mind, you will be immigrants, you will be from a despised people that traditionally has been our enemies. And Moab in the book of Judges has invaded Israel before and tyr tyrannized over them. Isn't there a specific ban on Moabites entering the congregation as well? Yes, the law least? forbade Ammonites and Moabites to come into the congregation. The language is a little vague. I, not until the 10th generation, not forever. Hmm. So the word forever, the Hebrew word, has a lot of, of stretch to it. It can mean indefinitely for the foreseeable future, and it can literally mean forever. Mm -hmm. So it's not clear whether it would mean, you know, 10 generations, well, you know, never, ever, ever, or if it literally does mean Ten generations, like anyone's going to pull that one off, but if they did, it would be all right. But, and here's the thing, that would be for a male entering the congregation as a ruler, mm -hmm. or as what we would call a voter, someone who can vote and hold office, run for office and such. That was the con That's the concept of congregation. The congregation was not just the people who lived there. It's the people who exercised, in some degree, political authority. And uh, this will be something maybe we can talk about. The next time we do a thing on Ruth, the, yes, there were immigration laws. They didn't keep people out, but they did keep certain peoples from holding political office until cultural transformation had happened. But it applied to the men. It didn't apply to the women. If the women, you could marry a Moabite, and she could become the mother of your child, and your child could enter or would be part of the congregation, of course, if the mom worshiped was a, Yahweh. Worshiped Yahweh. So that's what's going on here. Yeah, I mean, Naomi is no doubt processing all. She doesn't say it all, but she obviously knows enough about God's law to understand, and, and about Israel, to understand, I can't promise you anything if you come back. You may be completely rejected. There may be no place for you. Sure, the laws technically say you're allowed to glean, but what kind of life is that? I don't want to pull you into that. So... It would be better if you went back to your gods and died and went to hell. Again, is what she's saying. It's not her bitterness here over what's happened to her, over God's providence, is has seriously skewed her understanding of this life, of this world, and of what's really important. However, Ruth isn't buying into it. Ruth said, entreat me not to leave thee or to return from following after thee. For whither thou goest, I will go, and where thou lodgest, I will lodge. Thy people shall be my people, 
and thy God my God. Where thou diest will I die, and there will I be buried. The Lord, Yahweh, do so to me and more also, if aught but death part thee and me. That's pretty strong. I, I've actually heard people say, well, all she's saying is I love you a lot and I'll go wherever you will and I'll pick up whatever religion you have. That's not what she's saying. <laughs> she has just said, "Your God." she knows who her God is. And she takes an oath in the covenant name of God, the name of Yahweh or Jehovah. Mm -hmm. So she is And the God. phrase, do so to me, it's like, that's kind of hard to get the, the meaning across with just words, but like clearly there's some hand motion There's some hand going motions, going motions there, this. probably like something, <laughs> uh, your, your thumb cutting through your throat or tearing yeah. open your, your, yeah, your chest or something. It's, it's, it's self-maledictory. Mm -hmm. May God tear me to pieces if anything but death parts us. So Ruth is not content to go back. The, the other girl loved Naomi as a mother figure, as a friend, as a sweet older lady, as someone who's really nice, but she wasn't ready to break with her culture. And although she had in some, to some degree broken with her gods, it was not a heart thing. She was willing to go back and Naomi pronounces, she has gone back to her gods. She has abandoned the faith. You should do the same. Now, if this had been put forward merely as a test, that would be one thing. But there's no indication here that Naomi's testing her. And she's just really mad. And we're told that when she saw that she was steadfast-minded to go with her, then she left off speaking to her. Which means she didn't talk to her for a long while. <laughs> You're not doing things my way. This is not how I wrote the script. Okay, fine. Come, but I'm not, I'm not saying anything to you for a while. And... They make their way out of Moab. You can see them walking down the path. <laughs> and Naomi's always trying to get to the other side of the road so yeah. Ruth will walk with her. And, I'm not speaking to you. I'm not speaking to you right now. <laughs> they come to Bethlehem. And the Naomi apparently was quite well known because the, all, it says all the city was moved about them. They said, is this Naomi? They hadn't seen her for quite a long time, many years now. And she says, call me not Naomi, do not call me sweetness, call me Mara, bitterness. For the Almighty hath dealt very bitterly with me. I went out full, and the Lord hath brought me home again empty. Why then call you me Naomi, seeing the Lord hath testified against me, and the Almighty hath afflicted me? There's a couple things here. First of all, um, Naomi is indeed quite bitter. On the one hand, she recognizes the sovereign hand of God. On the other, she is unwilling to take any responsibility for anything that led up to this fiasco. Uh, most of God's people did not fly off to Moab. Most of them waited it out, and God was gracious to them. It is, it is Moab that swallowed up her, her husband and their sons, in whatever fashion. And in, but in acknowledging God's sovereignty, she does not acknowledge that God does have a plan for her that is good. That being amongst God's people, whom she still believes in in spite of everything, that God has a good plan here. The other thing that she could not possibly know, and no one would know for another, what, thousand years, is that someone named Mara, Mary, coming to Bethlehem, is a little bit uh, auspicious and prophetic. And so we should already begin thinking in terms of the promise of God, in terms of the Messiah, mm -hmm. those as we read backward with 2020 hindsight. We can think too of the Passover, of the bitter herb, and, mm -hmm. and the house of bread, and she's empty. Yeah, I hadn't thought about that before. <laughs> and you mentioned Passover. It's the beginning of barley harvest. Mm. It's Passover time. <laughs> <laughs> mm. So things are going to be happening here. Well, as they settle down, we find out that Naomi has a kinsman, near kinsman, of the family of Elimelech, whose name is Boaz. And that just hangs there for a second. Ruth, who's called a Mo Moabitess now, focusing on her foreignness, her otherness, says to Naomi, let me go now to the field and glean ears of grain, uh, in whose side they shall find grace. She understands the gleaning laws which and we'll talk more about them the next time we come to Ruth. But basically, God had commanded farmers to not get every single bit of grain out of their fields when they harvested them, 
uh, but to leave some so the poor could come in. Now, this this was not exactly a handout because you still had to go in and pick it all up and pluck some of it, and then you had to thresh it and, and do all of that by the handful rather than by the cartful. And when you were done after a long day's work, backbreaking work, you might have enough to feed your family for that night. Then you come and do it again. Mm -hmm. it, it, was, it was hard. And we'll talk more about why God did it this way. But Ruth is, is a strong young woman, a diligent young woman, energetic. And she says, I, I understand the practice. And I need to find, I understand I have to have permission of the landowner. I'm sure I can find someone who'll let me. So let me go do this. And that one says, Psh, okay, go. Mm, yeah, we <laughs> kind of need to eat. Because Naomi's too old for this. And she goes and she finds a field where there are reapers at work and apparently gets the permission of the, of the foreman, who was an enlightened man who realized just by looking at her, you're not from around these parts, are you? <laughs> Skin was probably a little darker, different makeup, different clothing, a decided accent. But he says, um, all, all, all right. And she, he may, because later he knows who she is. So he probably asks around just a little bit and says, all right, well, okay. You're, oh, you're Naomi's daughter-in-law. All right. Well, here, here's, how the, here's how it works. And just, you know, stay out of the way of the gleaners and such. And, and so she begins early in the morning. For a long time. The text says it was her hap to light on a part of the field belonging to Boaz. It's Boaz's field. Her hap, happenstance, chance, <laughs> luck. God says. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, what Brian, a crazy random happenstance. Brian is doing air quotes for us. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> the Bible does talk that way from time to time. Time and chance happen to, them, to us all. So we can still have potlucks even yeah, we though can, we're reformed? Yeah, even though we're reformed, we can still oh, have cool. potlucks. Awesome. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, Bethlehem, uh, Bethlehem, Boaz shows up and greets his reapers. The Lord be with you. They say the Lord bless thee. Apparently, they're on good terms. They respect him as, a, as an employer. Um, and it doesn't take long for him to say, who's the young lady? <laughs> uh, the servant, the foreman says, um, it's the Moabite damsel that came back with Naomi out of the country of Moab. And she asked me if she could come and glean after the reapers among the sheaves. It's a little, little bit bold. Not just can I wait till you they're done and come. Can, can I come in? I'll just I'll stay out of their way. But if I can just you know get in there and pick up the stuff as it's falling, it'll just would you mind? Is it okay? And he said yes. She came and have continued even from the morning till now, except tearing a little bit in the house. Probably took a bathroom break. And Boaz is moved to go talk to her. Now. I think it's evident that Ruth was very attractive. How much that reading between the lines. Reading between the lines. Um, yeah, first thing, la, 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 la. who's the girl? Where's she from? <laughs> I must go talk to her now. Uh, no doubt her character played into this, but yeah, no. But he's a good deal older than she is. We're not told exactly how much, but he makes a deal about it later. And so he goes over and says, Carest thou not my daughter? Go not thou to glean in another field, neither go from hence, but abide here fast by my maidens. His, he has uh, either girls who are helping with the harvest, or it may be others who are to whom he's extending charity. Uh, keep your eyes on this field that they're reaping. Don't go after them. I've charged the young men not to touch you. You're going to be safe here. And if, you, uh, if you're thirsty, you can go over and drink some of the water that the young men have drawn. <laughs> They may be looking at boss. We draw. We 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 pull the water out, and they'll gladly share it with you, right, boss? <laughs> Pulling water out of a well actually is kind of kind of tough work. But he's he's isn't that traditionally in other places in the Bible women's work? Well, yeah, to it go would and draw the water from the it well. would be. Uh, so whether they drew it themselves or their wives got it early in the morning or whatever, or somebody got it. But it's it's it was water that was drawn specifically for his workers, and he mm -hmm. is going to share it with her. He's and supplying let, uh, it to her rather than the other way around. Yes, very good. Um, and she falls on her face, out of respect, bows herself. Why have I found grace in thine eyes that thou shouldest take knowledge of me, seeing I'm a stranger, an alien, a foreigner? I'm a foreigner. Why are you being so nice to me? 
Boaz said, It has fully been showed me all that thou hast done unto thy mother-in-law since the death of thy husband, and how thou hast left thy father and thy mother, and the land of thy nativity are come into a people which thou knewest not hitherto for. The Lord recompense thy work, and the full reward be given thee of the Lord God of Israel, under whose wings thou art come to trust. He knows more than the foreman told him. She apparently has been a subject <laughs> of town gossip. Everybody knows about Ruth. She has established herself as, as a godly young woman who loves her mother-in-law, is a hard worker. Has She's been showing up in synagogue. Uh, she's recognized as someone who is a God-fearer and who, who trusts Yahweh. Uh, so he's heard all that and all he needed to hear. Oh, that? <laughs> that Ruth. Okay. Yeah, got that. All right. So he's going to be nice to her. He also knows something else that he doesn't mention now. He knows that he's related to Elimelech and thus to Naomi and thus indirectly to Ruth. So there's a certain feel of familia obligation as well. Mm. But there's a hitch that's kind of the secret turning point of the story later. So he he blesses her and says and, and affirms that he has she has come to trust in Yahweh Elohim of Israel. And she says, let me find favor in thy sight, my Lord, for thou hast comforted me, for that thou hast spoken friendly unto thy handmaid, though I be not like one of thy handmaids, dress differently, hair different, makeup, different speech patterns, different accent. Yeah. But Boaz continues, when, it, when it's mealtime, come here and, and, and eat of, of the bread and dip thy morsel in the vinegar. You can use the condiment table. <laughs> and, and you can sit... Oh, come over here. You can sit. You can sit down with the reapers. You can come into the company, you know, table area and and and, and sit down and use the condiments. And he even says, "Okay, don't no, don't eat your stuff here. Have some of mine." And he reaches some of the parched corn and gives it to her. The text says she did eat and was sufficed and left. That means she had leftovers. He gave her so much she couldn't even eat it all. So she stashes that away for later. And um, she goes back to work. She doesn't tarry. He doesn't flirt with her. Uh, he's he's kind of gone over the top and showing her favor, but it's all been very proper and above board with a lot of people watching. But now he goes to his guys on the sly and says, let her glean even among the sheaves. Don't reproach her. And let fall some of the handfuls of purpose for her. Yeah, drop some stuff where she'll get it, but don't be obvious, Okay. Help the girl out, but don't don't tip the hand here. If you could not. She gleaned in the field until even, and she bet out what she had. It was about an ephah, which is a good amount for, for two women to share. So she worked really, really hard. And she takes it, and she goes back to her mother-in-law, and she takes her leftovers and hands it to Naomi. So there's immediate food there without having to do a lot of work to prepare it. And Naomi is excited and impressed. Where did you work? Where did you glean? Blessed be he of the Lord that took knowledge of you. Well, the guy's name is Boaz? Oh, really? <laughs> ah, blessed. The wheels start to the turn. The wheels are turning. <laughs> blessed be he of the Lord who hath not left off his kindness to the living of the dead. This man is one is near of kin to us, one of our near kinsmen, Goel, kinsman redeemer. Now she says one of. So she hasn't checked the genealogies lately. And she doesn't know exactly where he stands, but she's hopeful. There are prospects here. <laughs> and so her advice is well, well Ruth says. He said to, to keep by the young men until they've ended all the harvest. And Naomi says, it's good, my daughter. Go, go, they'll go out with his maidens. They meet you not in any other field. So she kept fast by his maidens to the end of barley and of wheat harvest. Wheat harvest is several months later, Feast of Tabernacles. So, so basically throughout the entire liturgical cycle from Passover to Tabernacles, all the harvest time, she is in the fields, one crop after another, but we're not told whether or not Boaz ever peeks out and looks at her again or shows up accidentally, coincidentally. <laughs> oh, fancy meeting you here in my fields. No mention of that at all. He obviously respects her, admires her. She's an attractive lady. She's a hard worker, fierce God, loyal to family, all kinds of good things going for her, but he isn't doing anything. And several months have passed. 
And Naomi, like all good gentles, <laughs> says, <laughs> my daughter, shall I not seek rest for thee that it may be well with thee? There's that concept of rest coming back again. Mm. Boaz is our is of our kindred, and he's winnowing barley tonight in the threshing floor. So now they've got apparently their... They're in the wheat. I, I, I think what this means, and I could be wrong, is that they've gathered the. They're, they're working on wheat harvest, but they've finally got to the last processing step in the bar, barley of, of winnowing it, and they're about to mm-hmm. finish that off. Mm-hmm. So, you know, when the harvest is in, that's a celebration. And Tabernacles was in part a harvest feast where you celebrated all the good stuff that God had done. You brought your tithes of all your crops and all that. So that being so, there's going to be, they're going to be out late tonight. There's going to be a party. There's going to be celebration. He'll sleep with the workers. So gussy yourself off, more or less what the original says. Wash thyself therefore and anoint thee. So take a bath, put on your, your oils and creams and such, put on some nice clothes, put Raymond on and go down to the threshing floor. But don't let anyone know you're there. Until they're done eating and drinking. And when he lies down, mark where he where he's lied down. And then when he's asleep, you go in and you uncover his feet and lay down. That is beside him on top of his legs or something. And he'll tell you what to do. Scandalous. This is it, a, it, it, yeah. very it, forward. Very yeah. forward. Very forward. And Ruth says, okay, mom. <laughs> She figures Naomi knows what she's talking about and knows the customs of the day better than Ruth. As in Ruth's country, probably this would not have been that big a deal, just a little weird. <laughs> you know, I just go up and tell the guy, and then he, and you know, I would kiss him or something, and he would or not. Okay, this is how it works here. Okay, interesting. <laughs> I'll do. I'll do whatever you tell me to do. But in Israelite culture, yeah, this looks rather forward. Um, but Naomi's thought process seemed to be Boaz is old. He probably thinks he doesn't have a chance. Or he's a guy. And you know how guys are. <laughs> they need oblivious. A sh- oblivious. They need a shove. He may not think he has a chance. Or he may just need the gumption and the courage. If Ruth starts it, I mean, he's an intelligent businessman. He'll, he'll know the next move once he knows he's got a green light. So go do this. Now, the commentators, as I've read them over the years, all kind of come to the uncover his feet and lie down and say, we don't know what that means. It could simply mean uncover his feet and lie down. That would be the obvious meaning. (laughs) His feet get cold, he wakes up. Yeah, exactly. On the other hand, the feet is often a euphemism for other lower parts of a man, the male's body. Mm -hmm. So whatever it was... Although it would seem very forward, it's not wrong. It's not immoral. It's just a little unusual. Um, And she agrees to do it. Well, she goes down and waits and he lies down. It's a big celebration. And she comes softly and covers his feet and lays down. And about midnight, he was really sleeping good. About (laughs) midnight, he wakes up. He's afraid, turned himself and behold, a woman lay at his feet. Who art thou? I am Ruth, thy handmaid. Spread therefore thy skirt over thy handmaid, for thou art a near kinsman. That is, enfold me within your cloak, make us one flesh. Marry me, Boaz. (laughs) And um, this is his response. Blessed be thou of the Lord, my daughter. For thou hast showed more kindness in the latter end than at the beginning Inasmuch as thou followest not young men, whether poor or rich. See, he wasn't as young as everybody else. But here it is. Here's the plot twist. But now, my daughter, fear not. I will do for thee all that thou requirest, for all the city of my people doth know that thou art a virtuous woman. And now it is true that I am my near kinsman. I'm a kinsman redeemer. Howbeit, there's a kinsman nearer than I. Bom, bom, bom. Oh, we thought you were just lame and needed a shove. Do you mean there's actually a legal problem here? Now, and he's thing, done his homework. He's done his homework. He's apparently he's done his homework. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, now there, there there is a technicality here. The law said if brethren dwell together, mm-hmm. the kinsman redeemer law could be invoked. 
So by moving out to Moab, they Elimelech it. has stepped out of that situation. He had stepped out of the protection of the law. He's forfeited it. Now, they, the next of kin can proceed out of grace and charity and for financial reasons because these people who left, they didn't forfeit the title to their land. They've come back. Mm -hmm. And there might be good reasons to marry such a person, but it's no longer a requirement. And the person who refuses is not necessarily in sin or uncharitable or whatever. He may have other concerns. And apparently, the, we would presume the law does not apply if you're already married. Right. Yeah. Because <laughs> bigamy, bigamy was right out, and this doesn't yeah. this doesn't undo that. So that that we should spend a little time on that because the law does describe what should happen for a woman whose husband takes another wife. So clearly, it wasn't unheard of. Mm -hmm. But that doesn't make it okay. Doesn't mean it was okay then, but. She oh, was mean, still entitled to certain rights, right? Yeah, you mean the whole bigamy thing? Yeah. Yeah, the the Old Testament, as far as I can see, never approves of bigamy. But it does recognize it as a thing that people would do. And the problem, the practical problem that, that we don't get in the 21st century because of the influence of the gospel, both culturally and technologically, in that culture, if a woman married a man, she became financially dependent upon him in most cases. Mm -hmm. And for a man to marry two women was to put them both, at, in a sense, at his mercy. He became financially responsible for both of them. And were he to send one packing, that would leave her without resources, without fallback, without a visible means of support. She probably would have no financial reserves and no skills for taking care of herself, which meant basically she could sell herself into slavery or she could become prostitute. Same and when thing. we get to the New Testament, we, we, we see this being worked out. Uh, when Paul gives orders concerning such things, he says that the leaders in the church are to be one woman men. But he doesn't say, and all of you people who have multiple wives, get rid of a bunch of them. Because that would not be kind. It is they, they got themselves into a situation where they are responsible for another human life. They shouldn't have, but they have. So and, Nehemiah dealt with that differently, didn't he? Um, Ezra did. Ezra, sorry. Yeah, ne Nehemiah was, yeah, that's something else. <laughs> uh, in Ezra's case, they had married unbelievers. Mm -hmm. God's, uh, the, the, the covenant males had married unbelievers. Basically, their father, God, annulled the marriages by force. Mm -hmm. But in this, and, and there it wasn't bigamy. It was, you know, you've, you've been married a year or so, send them back to their father's house. Or, and I think the implication was, if that doesn't happen, you still have to take care of them. Mm -hmm. They just won't be your, they won't be your wives. So it, it was an awkward situation. And uh, the gospel began to rectify it as soon as the gospel lived in the world by saying that, that pastors and elders are to have only one spouse. It set a precedent for the rest of the church. You want leadership in the church. You want you want to matter. You better not be marrying a bunch of ladies. It's not the way of things. And of course, the example of Christ himself, who has one bride, the church. Mm -hmm. But in the old covenant, when they were still trying to figure out how many gods they had, <laughs> God did not emphasize this as much as he as we might think he would have, but he's God and he knows what he's doing. And, but, and, but when you look back over the Old Testament, you, you, you think, yeah, all of those guys who had so many wives, there weren't that many. Mm -hmm. We know about Abraham. He had two. Isaac only had one. Jacob had four. Uh, one of them was not his idea. The other two at the insistence of his two wives. Hannah's husband, Okana, had two. Well, that didn't work well at all. The, ones, the, the people that we find who had multiple wives mostly were the kings of Judah and mm -hmm. Israel. They tended to have a lot, although there were a few exceptions. And they were explicitly told not and to. And they were explicitly told not to. So, <laughs> yeah. And when Jesus is asked about it, he says, he who made them in the beginning made them male and female. Let what God hath joined together, let not man put asunder. These twain, these two, shall be one flesh, not these three, four, or five. But Genesis doesn't actually say these two. Jesus added that because mm. he's God and, and may have been the one who said it. He may, as the angel of the Lord, have been standing there saying it. If not, he said it through Adam or Moses. So he can explain to us what he meant. He meant you two are one flesh, and that was the original plan. So the Bible never saw polygamy as any kind of thing that 
anybody should be following. Mm -hmm. But given the fact in that culture that it was so common and they were start, still starting out, okay, we got five gods, five wives. Yeah. He, but just don't, he, he moved if you're going to do that, women. don't rob your wife of her clothes and raiment and food and stuff. Yeah. <laughs> and that was true whether whether it was a second wife or whether it was an unendowered wife, because mm -hmm. that's with respect to concubines. Uh, whether you're you're taking her on as a junior wife, yuck, or whether she's your, your wife, but you're not treating her as a free woman, she still has that protection. The law still protected women far more than the law of any other nation. And with the coming of Christ, that is transformed and all of God's daughters are free women and to be treated as such by their husbands. But we're talking about kinsmen redeemers. And I thought you were going to say, how about the rest of the kinsmen redeemer law? Oh, sure. Yeah, because, let's do that too. <laughs> <laughs> because if it's done properly and in the right context, that is the, the brethren have dwelt together and it's a legal obligation and someone skirts it. Then the bride was supposed to go to the man, take off his shoe, spit in his face, and then give the shoe to someone else and say, so shall it be done to him that refuses to raise up seed to his brother in Israel. Mm -hmm. uh, that doesn't happen here probably, well, possibly for a couple of reasons, possibly because it was kind of embarrassing and Israel stopped doing it because that's what Israel <laughs> tended to do when they didn't like God's law. But it may have been more specifically because this wasn't a requirement. And so mm -hmm. there was no shame involved. But there was still going to be the transfer of responsibility, the, okay, now you get to stand in my shoes kind of thing. So that was maintained. Well, the thing is that Boaz, despite the fact that he loves Ruth after some fashion, loves her in the sense that he respects her, likes her, thinks she's really cool, and is willing to take responsibility for her and take care of her for the rest of his life, we call that love. We're not, we're not told whether, you know, he had the hots for her, as my generation would have said, <laughs> um, found her sexually attractive. He's, he is willing to make the commitment, which is far more important than getting emotionally and hormonally excited about a young lady. But he's going to play by the rules. And that's something else our culture doesn't understand. What, you love her? Just take her and run off with her. No one needs to know. Run, run to Vegas, get married and disappear and you're fine. He's not going to do that. He's going to go look the other guy in the face and say, look, this woman needs someone to take care of her. You're in line. And if you're not going to do it, I'm next. So what are we going to do here? Well, but he that's going to be tomorrow. So he says, "I'm uh, tarry this night, and it shall be in the morning that if he will perform unto thee the part of the kinsman, kinsman redeemer, well, let him do the kinsman's part. And you can see her cringing. I don't even know who this guy he is, and you're ready to give him <laughs> Give me off to him? What? But if he will not do the part of the kinsman to thee, then I will do the part of the kinsman to thee as the Lord liveth. Lie down until the morning. And she lay at his feet until morning. So, is there physical contact going on here? Yes. <laughs> not sexual. You know, I, I, I knew a gentleman who would who would say things like, you know, all, ta all touch between a man and a woman is sexual. Well, if you mean the two different sexes are involved, sure. <laughs> but come on. <laughs> that would say some things about Jesus and some of the women he let touch him. Let's be careful here. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, it does not need to be uh, either immodest or immoral for a man to touch a woman or even hold a woman to keep her warm or to keep her safe during the night. And they're very careful here. Because before it's sun up, before the evening star has sunk, he gets her up. And says, we don't want anyone knowing that a woman spent the night here. Because that would call everybody's integrity to question. People would question both. What were you doing out there in the middle of the night with a woman? Oh, Rue, well, here we thought you were this goody two-shoes and you went out and hung out with a man all night. Well, he's going to protect her reputation. Mm -hmm. and this is huge. Yep. And um, one of the things that I, I try to remember to tell the young men in my classes is you're responsible for this girl that you say you love. You're responsible not only for her purity, you're responsible for her reputation. Mm -hmm. And there's, you should not be putting her in an awkward spot where people are going to wonder what kind of girl she is. She needs to be above reproach and it's your job to make that happen. Mm -hmm. I'm also fond of looking um, young men in the eyes and saying, you just got engaged? Guess who's the greatest threat to this girl now? 
Me? Yes. Because <laughs> it's so easy to make excuses and to pretend, well, we're, we're nearly married. Yeah. Yeah. Close, in, close enough. Is close, not close only enough. counts in horseshoes and hand grenades. Well, yeah, exactly. <laughs> and government work. <laughs> and government work. I don't think you have enough to be close in government work. Anyway, uh, so she he has her bring her veil that she had. And he puts a bunch of barley in it as sort of a dowry because he doesn't got anything else on him, right? I'm sure he doesn't carry money or visa out. The- <laughs> he didn't have the ring ready? <laughs> no, he didn't have the ring ready. So he says, take this back to your mother-in-law. And she comes back. And of course, it's Naomi probably, knowing knowing such people, has been, you know, fell asleep in the armchair, waiting, waiting, listening for every little noise. And here she comes back. It's about sunup now. And I love the question. Who art thou, my daughter? <laughs> Is it Mrs. Boaz? <laughs> <laughs> Got a name change to work on here. And Ruth tells her everything. And, and here's here's what he sent to you, all this food. And Naomi says, sit still, my daughter, until thou know how the matter will fall. For the man will not be in rest until he hath finished the thing this day. <laughs> okay, got the picture. understand the whole dub. He was being honorable. Yeah, well, okay, so honor. Okay, he's going to fix that, though. He's going to find this guy. He's going to settle it. One way or another, you're going to be ready to get married by the end of the day. <laughs> so just just wait and trust God for 24 hours. <laughs> Give me some tea. Um, so, I can picture Naomi as a Mrs. Bennett sort of yeah. person where she's like, calm down, child, and she's the one all of fluster. Exactly. Yeah. Well, Boaz goes to the gate, which in those days functioned as city hall. And um, he sees the kinsman in question, whose name we're never given because it's so irrelevant. <laughs> it's the kinsman. And he says, oh, such a what? We're, again, we're not even giving his name. Hey, guy, pal, get over here. Buddy. Hey, dude. Yeah. Hey, dude. Exactly. And then once he's got him, he gathers around 10 of the elders and tells him, sit down. He is a man of influence in the city council. And he account he recounts what's happened. Naomi's come out of Moab. She's selling a parcel. Presumably, it's under some kind of debt or lien or something. There was a Limelex, and I was going to, I wanted to tell you about it. You can buy it and take responsibility for it, and it will be yours. That is, Naomi's getting old and the Jubilee's far enough off that it will go into your family. She doesn't have heirs as such, except, okay, all right, sounds good. Yeah, sounds good. Sign me up. Sign me up. I'll buy it, except that I mentioned. There is kind of an heir because she has a um, a daughter-in-law who needs bride or needs a husband. And so if you buy the land, you kind of got to marry the girl. And so everyone holds their breath. What day thou buyest the field of the hand of Naomi, thou must buy it also of Ruth the Moabite, as the wife of the dead, to raise up the name of the dead upon its inheritance. And the kinsman said... I cannot redeem it for myself, lest I mar my own inheritance. That's not really explained, nor does it matter. Economically calculating, uh, he may already have a son. Maybe he's a widower. Uh, we don't know exactly what's going on here. And it does, again, it really doesn't matter. He suddenly realizes that throwing a wife into the equation is going to confuse what inheritance goes where and whatever plans he had set are not going to yeah. happen. And since he's not required, and apparently there's no shame in this, he simply says, I can't do this. Now, this was the manner in former time in Israel concerning redeeming, concerning changing, for to confirm all things, the man plucked off his shoe and gave it to his neighbor. This is a testimony in Israel. So again, either because this had become the new norm, watering down God's law, or whether it just didn't apply the same way here, he takes his shoe and gives it to Boaz. He now has only one shoe. Um, and he uh, Boaz turns to the elders and says, you're all witnesses that I bought the land and I'm taking Ruth to be my wife to raise up the name of the dead upon his inheritance. That is, our first child will inherit the line, the title, the property of um, the whole family, actually, because it would all revert to her now. Your witnesses and all the people say, we are witnesses. It's a covenant cutting kind of thing. And they respond, the Lord, make the woman that has come into thy house like Rachel and like Leah, which too did build the house of Israel. And do thou worthily in Ephrata and be famous in Bethlehem. And let thy house be like the house of Pharaoh, whom Tamar bare unto Judah. It's interesting they bring that up. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I was just thinking that. <laughs> 
<laughs> but apparently they had grown enough in their understanding that they got past the neo-Victorian hurdles <laughs> and realized that what Tamar had done as a Canaanite and a Gentile was to worm her way back into the covenant family, having been invited in and thrown out. And they were okay with that because it was through her that the promised line was continuing, the line that would lead to the king eventually. So they, they include her. Boaz took Ruth, married her. She was his wife. And she conceives a son. Uh, and the women, her friends say, Blessed be the Lord, which hath not left thee this day without a kinsman, that his name may be famous in Israel. But now they're talking about the baby. Because he's going to grow up and he's going to take care of you in your old age. He mm -hmm. shall be to thee a restorer of thy life and nourisher of thine old age. For thy daughter-in-law, which loveth thee, is better to thee than seven sons. She's born him. Now we took the child and laid it in her bosom, but we became a nurse to it. And the women and her neighbors gave it a name, saying, There is a son born to Naomi. They called his name Obed. And you know, to this point, we're saying, okay, this is all interesting. It's a, it's a sweet love story. It's one of the most complete novelettes in scripture, only Esther compares. They're both stories about women, by the way. But what has this got to do with anything? Why is this in the Bible? <laughs> they called his name Obed. He's the father of Jesse, the father of David. And the book ends with four verses that trace the genealogy from Pharaoh, who we just mentioned, all the way down through Obed to Jesse mm. to David. It would be an appropriate book for someone like O. Samuel to write in the days when David was on the run. And people might be wondering, who is this David guy? And isn't Saul the lawful king? And should we maybe Saul decide with Saul? And shouldn't David be arrested and killed or something? Okay. There's more to this story than you know. <laughs> this is the line that leads to Messiah. And we get to Matthew's gospel. Matthew includes the name of four women in the line of the Messiah. Rahab and Bathsheba and Tamar and Ruth. Although he doesn't name Bathsheba. No, she who had been the wife of Uriah. Yeah. And one thing about those women, they all it were, depending on how you look at it, they were all Gentiles. Were, Bathsheba may have been a Hebrew by birth, but she was married to a Hittite. So by covenant, she was Hittite. Mm -hmm. Tamar was Canaanite. Rahab was Canaanite. Um, and uh, Ruth here is Moabite, which means she was had a lot of Canaanite blood in her. And yet it doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. And here we are, and, and when we get to Samuel, this will make more sense. We've already seen that the Mosaic Covenant was unraveling because the spiritual force was gone. The promises were there, but the people designated to proclaim the promises, the Levites, for 300 years weren't doing their job. And when we come to Samuel, we're going to see, and the priests aren't doing their job. And then we're going to lose the Ark of the Covenant. Then we're going to get a king who is a murderer and consults with witches. It's just like the whole thing is about to be lost. Meanwhile, in this quiet little town that has a checkered past, God does something special. He has an old man marry a young woman. He has a kinsman redeemer marry a Gentile bride. And out of that, everything is turned around and it leads directly in a couple generations to David, a man after God's own heart, the one with whom God will renew his covenant. So is it a Christmas story? It's pretty close. We got Mary coming to Bethlehem. We have a reference to the covenant uh, of David, a hint that it's coming, that promises the, uh, the king who will reign over Israel forever. And at the heart of it is a love story, like God's love for his people. Here, Boaz reaches out in love to rescue this Gentile widow. Mm -hmm. She doesn't have a husband. She's forsaken, barren, isolated, alienated. And he, playing by the rules and moved by more than the rules. The rules don't require him to do this. He's moved by grace. He's moved by love. Not the love of infatuation and lust, but the love of here's someone I need to help. And yet he, at the same time, observes the rules, works through them and in terms of them, to bring about a, a successful marriage and a fruitful one that leads to David in the New Covenant. So, Merry Christmas. <laughs> There's the story. It's a story about the true nature of godly love and what courtship can look like. There's a lot of violation of things that normally you don't really want to happen in a courtship relationship. You don't really want to send your 
your young lady, your girl out and say, you know, go find the guy while he's alone and after he's had a lot to drink and uh, lay down. And you do. <laughs> but the way, the context is everything. Mm-hmm. The context of, of the their character, of their relationship, of what she was communicating, what she was doing was proposing legitimate marriage uh, and knowing that he was under a constraint of some sort to comply. And he was a gentleman and he protected her. And what comes out of it is a beautiful marriage and one of the greatest love stories in the Bible. Second to, of course, the love that Jesus has for his church. Mm-hmm. Awesome. I think that pretty much wraps it up. We should do some recommendations. <laughs> okay. <laughs> you got one? I do, actually. Well, so now I'm on the fence, so I'll throw two at you. Christ- Christmas special bonus recommendation from Emily. One is going to be Entreat Me Not to Leave You, the choral setting by Dan Forrest, which is just remarkable um, and delightful. And then the other is also musical. It's Andrew Peterson's album, Behold the Lamb of God. It's Mm -hmm. a Christmas album, but it spends a lot of time in the Old Testament Mm. and ties the story together Mm. as it should be done. (laughs) Um, he, He often does a live stream concert around Christmas time. So I'm hoping he'll do one of those and I can rent the rent the streaming video because I don't live anywhere near Nashville. So. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Oh, do you have one, Brian? Yes. Uh, Sinclair Ferguson's Advent devotional that he published. I don't actually remember when he published it because he published another one like for this year, but mm. um, it's called Love Came Down at Christmas and it is a verse by verse well, actually, parts of verse by parts of verse, uh, exposition of First Corinthians thirteen, the love mm. chapter, mm. and a analysis of how Christ fulfills it oh. uh, in Himself, and uh, why it was necessary uh, for Him to be incarnated in the first place, and how His incarnation is an expression of that particular quality of love. My wife and I have been going through it uh, this Advent, and it has been just wonderful and lovely each morning to look at how Christ is love. Wow. Well, that outclassed everything I was going to suggest. So uh, there's only one place I can go from there to go up, and that's to go to the Bible itself. (laughs) I got to tell the Christmas story to my Bible class today. Mm. I didn't tell, I didn't read it from the text. I did not even tell them what I was doing. I said, I'm going to tell you a story. It was a long time ago in this town out on the periphery, a despised town. That, yeah, there was a military presence, but there wasn't much going on, a little foreign traffic. And there was this, this man, he was a um, contractor, to work with wood a lot. And finally, I had to say, he was a carpenter. Mm, I tried to get past <laughs> that one real fast. His name was Joe, at which point everyone goes, Oh! <laughs> Some people still didn't get it, apparently, until I said, yeah, and his fiance went off to visit her cousin, um, Liz. <laughs> oh, I see what you did there. Anyway, it was fun telling it from Joseph's point of view and what would have gone through his mind and trying to, to take it out of what we often make it, which is fairy tale land. Mm-hmm. Uh, a little Gnostic, sweet, otherworldly tale. Oh, I got show... the bell. Got the yeah. bell. Ah, there it is. <laughs> Thank you. Mm-hmm. And to tell the story like it really happened, uh, with all the, the pains and the anguish and the not-so-silent night and all of that. Mm-hmm. So it was it was a joy to me to tell it. And they were quiet the whole time while I was telling the story, and they listened. Uh, and a few of them came back later, and so that was great. We really enjoyed that. Although one girl said, but it was better when you said it in modern times, because I've done that before, you know, Mary and Joseph driving, fleeing Sacramento because (laughs) the governor is after them and their little, they're in their little VW bug. uh, The shepherds become migrant workers. The wise men become Russian ambassadors. And they're fleeing fleeing to Tijuana. Well, I mean, that that is one of the things that I've found interesting. You know, I, I think it gets the, – the specific example I'm thinking of gets used for political score, uh, point scoring. But when you think of it as like, well, Jose and Maria and their small child, Jesus. Yeah, and that's what I did. fleeing from a de- – like a, a, you know, violent dictator who is murdering 
children in Jesus's age range. Right. And it's like, will you have pity on them? <laughs> yeah. And, and I, I, I called her Maria and they called the child Yeshua, but, you know, by the way, they had it figured <laughs> out. Um, so tell the Christmas story to your children. Mm -hmm. Tell it not like a fairy tale. Tell it as it in fact is, as it really happened in history. Mm -hmm. And it will be fresh and it's always exciting. And it's always new and it's always very human and it's always very divine. So there's my recommendation. Yeah. I, I should tell you, Greg, if I should have opened with this because this will, if this doesn't sell you on listening to Andrew Peterson's album that I recommended, <laughs> I don't think anything will, but he has a song that starts out with the line, it was not a silent night. <laughs> ah, yes. <laughs> I, I forget who I was talking with, but I, I mentioned, oh, I think it was on Twitter, but I mentioned something about like how that song is, is you know, get the bell ready. It's a little bit Gnostic yeah. um, <laughs> where it's like, you know, I, I called it with a baby, baby Jesus, the glow stick. Yes. Was, you know, radiant okay, beams we're, we're gonna get, from thy... <laughs> Holy, yeah, we're gonna get we're gonna get letters on this one. Yeah. <laughs> That's right. I'll just direct people to Andrew Peterson's yeah, song go. "Labor of Love." Mm -hmm. It was not yeah. a silent night. There was blood on the ground. Yeah. Yep. Starting with Mary's own blood. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So well. on that note, <laughs> somehow right. we still managed to end on a downer, <laughs> um, even though we were talking about Ruth, and it's like the happiest love story ever. Anyway, thank you guys so much for this conversation. <laughs> it's been a pleasure. Uh, thanks also to David, our producer, and my lovely husband. Uh, thank you to our financial supporters. We appreciate you keeping the show rolling. If you'd like to join their number, you can visit our website, anchor.fm slash halting towards Zion. Uh, please send us an email. We'd love to hear from you. Halting towards Zion at gmail.com is the best way to reach us. Uh, you can follow us on YouTube, Rumble, and your favorite podcast catcher. Have a good night. <laughs>